So I think some degree of inflation is perhaps not inevitable, but favorable. Ethereum as sort of, you know, the first of its kind of this smart contract system model, et cetera. It's living in the future of every other L1. The question that people always ask me, having done this research, is like, oh, well, what percent of the population would you say is using is using crypto in a place like Venezuela? And it's like, the answer to that is not going to be what you want to hear. <laughs> Welcome to Beneath the Layers by Offchain Labs. I'm your host, Hunter, and today we're speaking with Jill Gunter, CSO at Espresso Systems. We'll be speaking about her background, studying government and economic policy, her time working in traditional finance, and pick her brain a little bit about the impact of inflation, layer twos, and the crypto industry as a whole. And of course, a side note, we at Offchain Labs are collaborating with Espresso Systems on research that we end up speaking about within the episode. So that being said, let's get into it. All right. So I think I think the way we want to start this uh, this episode off is very simple. Uh, maybe give us an idea of where you're from and are you still there now? Let's start off with that. Why not? Yeah, absolutely. So I grew up in the Boston area. Um both of my parents worked on Wall Street, actually. Uh, they both had Wall Street careers. And so I kind of grew up, I guess, around finance with, you know, the FT on the table and CNBC on TV and what have you. Um, I have migrated, I would say, pretty far afield from both of those things, both from the East Coast and also from traditional finance. I am now an inhabitant of the Bay Area, oh. where I've been for the last seven years. Okay. And... As you know, I work in crypto. <laughs> <laughs> right. God forbid you say you tell that to the wrong person, by the way. I work in crypto. Oh, my God. Like, or it's like whenever you tell someone that, it's like, you know, like they'll always, they'll always ask you about the market. It's always about the market. <laughs> oh, totally. Totally. I actually, depending on who it is that I'm talking to, I have these different ways of sort of obfuscating it of like, oh, I work in tech. I work for a startup. Yeah, yeah. Don't worry about it. Oh, I work for like a financial technology startup. <laughs> I feel like this totally. is a safe space, to be honest, about <laughs> and upfront about working in crypto. <laughs> oh, for sure. I mean, I think I think what I've settled on is like, um, like, like we, we create blockchains. That's what I tell people. We create blockchains. I Love think that's that. Pr pretty I like like the other day, I had someone What's... asking me like, yeah, go for it, go for it. What's the follow-up to that, then? What's a blockchain? <laughs> no, you know, usually they don't ask anything after that. Like, that, <laughs> that's usually enough to them to be like, okay. <laughs> perfect, perfect. All right, I'm going to try that next time. <laughs> oh, yeah, oh, yeah. And then God forbid you get the guy who's like, oh, you mean like Bitcoin? It's like, yeah, yeah a little bit like Bitcoin. <laughs> like another Bitcoin. <laughs> well, the, this is the thing about, like, bull and bear market cycles. It's like... Yeah, yeah. In the bull market, you'll say, oh, I work in blockchain or crypto. I build blockchains. People will come up to you then and be like, oh, can you tell me how to like yield farm? Or can you set me up with Bruh. how to stake Ethereum or whatever? Like they'll have these very yeah. specific questions. And that is kind of difficult and painful to deal with in its own way. But then in the bear market, as I'm kind of saying, it's more kind of like, how do I just get out of answering this question altogether? Right. They're going to be asking me about FTX or, you know, some misconception about Bitcoin that they have or whatever else. Oh, totally. It's like how it's like killing the environment. Yeah, no, it's just, it's a loaded topic. This is definitely a loaded topic. For We're sure. going down the rabbit hole a little sure. too early, I think. <laughs> but okay. So, you know, uh, grew up in the Boston area. Uh, you know, now you said you're out on the West Coast pretty much now, right? Yeah. Okay. Um, so then where did you go to school then? Like somewhere in the middle, somewhere in New York or? No. So yeah, I, uh, I went to a small liberal arts college just outside of Boston. I, I went to Harvard for undergrad. <laughs> oh, there um, you go. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, uh, I, I actually studied of all things classics. Um, so I studied like Latin and ancient Greek and history. Um, and then I did a minor in government and, um, and spent some time doing sort of political economic stuff as well, which was to, to become more relevant to my future career path, certainly than all of the time I spent studying um, ancient Latin and, and Greek literature and, and history. But that said, I will say, I mean, there were a lot of lessons, I think, from studying these really like distributed 
empires that existed, you know, back thousands of years ago and, and their governance approaches and, you know, almost even like the propaganda that they used and so forth. Um, that there are themes of that that I do feel like come up in crypto nonetheless. So I definitely don't have any regret about pursuing that as, as a route of study. Um, but as I say, less relevant than the stuff that I was doing kind of secondarily on the government and e comm side. Totally. Uh, was there anything that you, I mean, you mentioned kind of ancient Greek, stuff like that. Like, was there anything in particular that you kind of, uh, any discoveries, I should say, or any kind of deep dives you did, like, while over there in, like, one of these societies and um, maybe how it relates? So, uh, I mean, in terms of my kind of academic studies there, like, I I ended up writing my undergraduate thesis on basically the role of religious propaganda in holding the Roman Empire together for as long as it for as, as long as it did hold together, which is a pretty good run, um, depending on when you start and stop the clock. Uh, and that, again, uh, there were definitely some lessons there in terms of, you know, this vast, diverse swath of empire um, that, you know, in many ways, you couldn't get more sort of distributed or decentralized or whatever word you want to use. You just think of the lack of technology that they had then where to get a message from one side of the empire to the other would take a matter of months. Um, and, uh, you then start to think about, okay, what was it like to actually govern that? What were the sort of levers that the rulers and the emp emperors and so forth could, could pull on in terms of propaganda and getting people's buy-in and, and getting, um, getting also then sort of their governors and their kind of like local officials to fall in line behind them. And, um, again, thematically, I think in terms of like thinking about governance in particular, whether that's corporate governance, whether that's governance of a sort of decentralized system in, um, in, uh, this, you know, technological realm that we're all now inhabiting. Uh, I do think that there's some thematic overlap, which is kind of cool. But... Oh, totally. And, and it's to your <laughs> point, it's like, it's, it's, it's as different, but also as similar as you want it to be. Um, and, mm -hmm. and especially similar in the way where it's like, I mean, like, like crypto itself, I mean, crypto, Web3, I guess, whatever people want to call it nowadays, like, like it, it spans like multiple industries, right? Like politics, uh, you know, uh, economics, um, like even just social stuff generally. Like I, I think back then maybe like there was, a, I think the term was uh, like um, pretty much ha having everything kind of ruled by code. I think I feel like pe crypto yeah. people used to go yeah, by yeah, that, yeah, yeah. but more recently yeah. I've started to notice code people is law. like, yeah. yeah, code code is law exactly. Like code is law, but people I think people now especially are starting to say like code is law, but like we govern that code and the changing of the code. So it's it's all social absolutely, and it's yeah. yeah so there's this meme I feel like that's gone around sort of the Ethereum community as of late, yeah. where it's you know the guy sort of holding the gun, the astronaut looking at the earth and, and the astronaut looking at the earth is like, wait, yeah. it was all X all along. And in this case, it's like, yeah. wait, it was all social consensus all along. And I feel like that is, um, that is very true of all of these blockchain networks that we've all been working on over the years. And as, as much as we want to believe in this sort of, uh perfect state where everything is just governed by the code and so forth as you say and as i think people are kind of coming to grips with it is all actual social human governance at the end of the day um so i guess that's been kind of a thread or a theme uh if i was to to try to draw one through all of my many wanderings over the last okay. 20 years I can't imagine someone like trying to like apply to a crypto based job with like that as their only kind of background, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. It might work if you pitch it the right way. <laughs> yeah, totally. Totally. I mean, expertise in governance is huge. It's everything. I mean, yeah. as we're recording this, the open AI fallout is kind of happening in real time. And I think that that is a big eye opener for a lot of people in terms of how important corporate governance is. Um, and all of the things that can go 
wrong there. And I think that something I've reflected on a lot over the last couple of days is that has all been playing out. It's like, wow, you know, I feel like being in crypto for any duration of time, being involved with protocol projects and these sort of new form or DAOs, these new forms of governance, you know, it's hard for me to imagine a seasoned crypto entrepreneur sort of falling into some of the traps that it looks like a lot of the open AI folks and their board and so forth have fallen into just because we've all been forced to really confront these questions of governance and, you know, what, what the right structure should be and who should hold sort of, you know, what powers in terms of hiring abilities or decision-making right. or, you know, allocation of resources and all of these types of things. Um, being crypto is definitely a crash course in social governance in all its forms. hundred percent. But if you think about it too, like, I think, I think even being in crypto probably wouldn't be enough to prepare you for it because it's like in the real world, it's not perfect. No. In crypto, it's definitely yeah. not perfect. Oh, <laughs> All sure. you know is that there's, there's sure. problems. You just don't know how to solve them. <laughs> well, it's you know? a little bit like the crypto use case thing where, I, I don't know, I, I feel like I, I've i spent most of my career in crypto really kind of on the use case application side. And right. now I'm very much on kind of the infrastructure side, but... You know, people will always take, take say, you know, a DeFi crypto insurance platform, right? And people will look at it and go through the user flow of it and be like, this is horrendous. This is not good user experience. You know, I've got to like buy these tokens, get onboarded. I've got to like remember, you know, the mnemonic or whatever for my password. This stresses me out. And then I'm, you know, getting this like crypto backed insurance, yada, yada. And then you go through the process of buying insurance in real life, like in <laughs> TradFi. And yeah. You're like sitting on hold on the phone with, you know, State Farm for hours or whatever. You're like, wait, this is also a terrible user experience. You know, this also has its problems in terms of opacity. You have no idea how the pricing is being done. You know, there's no open market. You're kind of like, maybe we're a little too hard on the crypto use cases because... You know, the traditional use cases are also totally broken, the traditional applications. I feel like the same goes in governance where, you know, we're all always so hard on ourselves, I think, in this space. Like, DAOs are totally broken. Like, the governance yeah. systems don't work. Like, you know, the more time you spend on these forums or in Discord, the more that your brain just breaks. And I can definitely <laughs> relate to that. But again, then you look at real world governance, whether it's corporate governance or whether it's, you know, state level governance or what have you, you're like, this is pretty broken too. So maybe we're not doing that badly in crypto. At least we're trying something new. But That's a good point, actually. You know, like it, it, this conversation is off to a great start. Like, you're making me more and more optimistic about crypto. <laughs> Dude, this is great. <laughs> but no, you're right, I'm though. I'm feeling totally very great. optimistic about crypto. But... <laughs> I think um I think during bear markets it's very easy for me to feel very optimistic. I think it's during the bull markets when everyone's I don't know just so overhyped about whatever right. it is about you know yield farming or some new use case that you're kind of scratching the head your head at the the actual utility of then then I tend to the crypto skeptic in me tends to come out. But it, totally feel that i totally feel that <laughs> i feel like actually I, I get that uh i'm like it's like things are things are almost too good you know <laughs> in a bull market mm -hmm. that is mm -hmm. um but let's yeah let's not yeah, let's not let's exactly. not drink anything exactly. <laughs> um okay so you have i don't so think we're in a bull market quite yet so no fear of that <laughs> no okay yeah oh my god you definitely pissed <laughs> off some of the crypto guys <laughs> oh my god <laughs> Um, You'll know when no, we get there. <laughs> by, by the time we figure out, it'll literally be like like halfway there, you know. Like we'll we'll, we'll, be, we'll be halfway to, to the all time high, probably. Not financial advice, of course. Should definitely preface that. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Um, yeah. But yeah okay, okay. <laughs> Always. So, so you have the you have the background of kind of like this like a uh, social governance thing. I'm going to say so that uh, to me that kind of fits into the crypto stuff. Um, <laughs> Uh, but so, where'd you go afterwards? Like, like, like after after college? I, I, if I understand correctly, you, you kind of went into finance. Is that true? 
Yeah, exactly. So after college, I went into finance. Um, I worked on Wall Street for a few years, I guess, as I kind of mentioned at the top of the podcast, in a way following in my parents' footsteps. Um, I worked on a bond trading desk, trading debt and derivatives. And um, I was specifically trading the debt and derivatives of Latin American countries. So I was spending a lot of time paying attention to the economies of places like Argentina and Venezuela. It was actually through that lens that I first got really excited about Bitcoin. um, Because, of course, at the time, and in fact, even still now, over a decade later, uh, these countries were going through periods of huge economic upheaval, hyperinflation, capital controls, et cetera. Um, And increasingly, this was back in sort of 2012, 2013, increasingly people were paying attention to Bitcoin in these countries as a way of, as an escape hatch, basically, as a way of getting out of their own inflating currency into something that was very speculative still, but felt, felt like a better bet than staying in, for example, the Argentine peso at the time. Um, and indeed, that trade will have done very well for anyone who actually execute on, executed on it. So that was the lens through which I started paying attention to crypto. Um, at the same time, I was applying to go back to grad school. I guess I sort of had it in mind that I was going to go back to grad school, get some of the formal training in political economics that I'd missed out on um, in my undergrad while I was studying Latin. And uh, then I kind of had this idea of coming back and joining a hedge fund and a research analyst role, something like that, still doing sovereign debt and derivatives, stuff like that. And needless to say, I got lost along the way <laughs> to, okay. to the hedge fund in Greenwich, Connecticut. Um, oh, I yeah, fell I deeper it. and deeper down the, uh, the Bitcoin rabbit hole instead and um, found my way to the West Coast after I, after I did end up doing a master's. Um, in political political economy, basically. So that's been that's been my journey out here, and wow. my journey into crypto. I, I have to ask, um, going back a little bit to your studies in Latin America, Argentina, Venezuela, etc. Like, uh, what's the biggest cause of hyperinflation? You think, and and, and do you think inf- like hyperinflation generally is is inevitable? So I think some degree of inflation is perhaps not inevitable, but favorable because it helps it helps the economy to grow, right? If you have a dollar sitting in your bank account and it is losing value at some hopefully quite moderate rate, then you are incentivized to go make better use of that dollar than it'll have just sitting in your bank account, right? This is kind of the the high level idea of why some amount of inflation is good. Um, so whether that's spending that dollar on a consumer good that you wanna have and putting that dollar back into circulation in the economy, whether that's investing that dollar in a loan to someone who can make better use of it and then you're getting a better return on that dollar than if it was just sitting in your bank account um, or whether you're investing that dollar in capex or equity in in a new venture or something like this again you're incentivized to get those dollars moving and and back into the economy so again some amount of inflation is a sign of a very healthy economy which is why you know most Western modern um, uh, central banks have this target of, you know, call it 2% inflation like the Federal Reserve has. Um, That's why we're not targeting zero. Where you run into issues is where inflation starts to run away (laughs) and where you have the government starting to print money and devalue the currency just in order to keep up with expenses, for example. So in both of these cases, Argentina and Venezuela, you know, you had these uh, sort of leftist socialist, uh, in the case of Venezuela, certainly be comfortable calling it a dictator in place for a long time in the form of Hugo Chavez. In Argentina, it was kind of a more democratically elected uh, governmental situation, but you nonetheless had these very sort of leftist socialist 
uh, folks in power um, for a very long time. And they ran up huge bills for the country, um, sometimes in order to, you know, really invest in sort of social welfare, sometimes in order to almost pretty directly buy votes, um, a lot of corruption going on as well. And then at some point, you've got to pay those bills. And um, the easiest way to do that at some point is to print a whole boatload of money um, and just keep adding zeros to the end of uh, of your of your local currency bills. And that's what both situations have done and, and were doing at the time, certainly, that I was trading their debt. Um, Venezuela, it's worth saying, much more so than Argentina. I think while I was... Well, I was on the desk trading these things. I think Venezuela was genuinely experiencing hyperinflation, which is a very, very high bar. Argentina was more on the order of like 40 to 50 percent inflation at its highest at the time. Um, But, you know, all of this, I think, helps put in context some of what in the United States people have been worrying about for the last couple of years in terms of taming inflation and this fear that, you know, we're, we're facing runaway inflation. I'm a lot less worried about that in the United States. You know, inflation is sort of topped out at high-ish single digits in the United States. And it seems like it's coming under control now, which is nowhere near the type of dysfunction that you've seen in, in these other countries. Interesting. I, and I think it's uh, inflation is such an interesting topic, though, because Maybe and actually, maybe in this case, similar to crypto, maybe not. It's like like the word itself. It always seems to draw from the public like a negative perception, like because because from from what you're saying, totally. a little inflation yeah. is needed, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. That's certainly my perspective, and that's certainly kind of the traditional sort of economics perspective. I would say right. at this stage. There are certainly those in crypto who believe in just having sound money, hard money, that we don't yeah. need inflation. Um, that's a very sort of different and I would say almost experimental viewpoint. I think that there are very few examples of uh, situations like that throughout history where we've seen an economy continue to run and thrive without some degree of inflation. I can't think of any. Um But uh, it's just, I think, a very different philosophical approach to what money is and its utility, uh, what its utility should be versus what what is the reality of society and societies around the world today. So, like, what would you say then is the uh, maybe some of the biggest differences that you've seen thus far kind of in that, uh, I guess we'll call it TradFi, for lack of a better word. Versus like being in the crypto industry because I mean you were you said you're at Wall Street, um, you know on, yeah. on a desk like you were you were you know you were in the uh, you're in the weeds. So I'm curious like what <laughs> what you kind of found was the difference. <laughs> yeah, I mean, gosh, there's so many different directions I could go with this. There's the sort of cultural differences, obviously, just between working on Wall Street and working in crypto. There's the yeah. you know market structure differences, and of course the technology differences. Um, I think what initially drew me in to crypto was the promise of an overhaul of the market structure, basically, for lack of a better way of putting it, where, you know, I started on Wall Street shortly after the 2008 crisis, and there was a lot of regulatory scrutiny at the time. There was a lot of well-placed concern about the lack of transparency in traditional financial markets, um, the lack of transparency around how much leverage banks and also the various funds who um, who transact with the banks all had on their books, um, a lack of transparency around what types of deals and what types of trades uh, were getting done, were happening, being facilitated. Um, and you know, this was all, even though I was working on Wall Street at the time, this was all frustration that I felt myself and shared and, and seeing the types of um, the types of risks, even post-2008, that were still being taken on Wall Street, um, left me with this feeling of sort of discomfort and like, there's got to be a better way. There's got to be a better solution to this. And so coming upon Bitcoin and starting to understand, like, oh, this is this fully transparent kind of real-time 
financial infrastructure alternative versus what we have in finance, which felt like this tangled web of like, no one fully knows who owns what at any given time or how much leverage a counterparty has at any given time. Some of that's by design and some of that is just by accident of the system and the technology. As the junior kid on the trading desk, because I was definitely the junior kid, I would often have to stay late and reconcile trades, you know, which literally involved me calling up our back office and operations team and having them call another bank's operations team and trying to figure out like, wait, what, you know, where are the bonds that are supposed to be settled today? Like this should have shown up. And just all of these sort of inefficiencies and again, the lack of transparency in some cases by design, in many cases, not at all by design, um, really inspired me when I started to understand what a blockchain was and and this, again, kind of alternative financial system. Um, So that was a big part of the driving force that got me into crypto. I will say it's been uh, kind of a reality check, I guess, over the last 10 years that I've worked in crypto now, (laughs) just like how much is still centralized within crypto, how many limitations there are in terms of how quickly we can be moving assets on chain um, to get the benefits of those transparency, uh, the the transparency of blockchains, um, all of these types of, again, just limitations. I think FTX, uh, FTX's fraud and collapse last year is a great example of this, where I at least had to take a good couple of days to kind of digest what had happened. So it's like, This is not, this is the opposite of why I got into crypto. Like, you know, crypto should be more transparent and and safe. And yet you have, myself included, you know, the majority of crypto transactions and users, et cetera, still going through these centralized third parties where perhaps the opacity is even worse than that of Wall Street. Um, But I do take part in the fact that During that time, during all of that volatility around FTX and prior to that, during the Terra collapse uh, earlier that year, DeFi worked, you know, DeFi kept working just as it was designed um, and DeFi stayed transparent. You could see things happening on chain that you wouldn't have been able to otherwise. I think of with the FTX collapse, the fact that uh, when the hack happened on FTX, um, as as Sam Bankman Freed was coming under arrest, and there was all kinds of questions about it, everyone could watch in real time as funds were being moved. Um, yeah. And those are all things that you know you you wouldn't get in a traditional financial institution. So I think that there are these glimmers of where crypto is helping in the ways that I sort of fantasized about, I guess, 10 years ago when I was first getting into the space. Um, But I do think that we've also got a really long way to go. We're going to move everyone and everything on chain, um, both in terms of the feasibility of that, the user experience of that, in terms of the fact that not everything should be transparent. Like we do need some privacy controls. And then, I mean, something that obviously your team and my team are both very passionate about, like, we've got to make it scale. We've got to make, um, we've got to make it be cost effective for people to actually use these systems and um, reasonable just in terms of the latency or delay that they, they have to expect and go through as well. hundred percent. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I couldn't, I couldn't have said it better myself. Uh, it, it, I totally agree too. It's like, you know, I, I think you know. I, I think it's a. It's a little bit of. I, th- I think it's more of a human problem than anything else. As ever, it always comes back to that. Yeah. Part of us building these systems is to have them be "quote unquote" trustless, right? Where at the end of the day, we're trusting the code, of course, which is backed by the people, but more or less, we're trusting the code. Um, but like, you like, there's just so many different like attack vectors where like centralized entities or just like things that are relatively opaque kind of insert themselves where it's like you can't have everything be 100 percent uh, open public and decentralized um like in a perfect world like for example like if 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 crypto yeah. was only things that were you know immutable on chain and that and that's it then you'd have maybe like five apps 
that's it. Like the Uniswap and maybe a couple others. I don't even know any others besides Uniswap, to be honest with you. Yeah. <laughs> like yeah, it's all kind no, it's of like true. a balancing act, I feel like. Absolutely. Absolutely. And just an iterative process to get to this kind of nirvana state that we all dream about where everything is happening on chain and, um, you know, we've migrated our whole lives over there. But... Yeah. Oh, yeah. So then, okay. So then in that case, you, uh, okay. So like you, you were attracted by this, this nirvana state, I should say, let's say. Um, what, what did you first do then when you, when you got into crypto? Did you just kind of, did you like start doing similar things? Like were you just trading in crypto when you first got in or? Did you kind of? Uh, I guess when I first way? started dabbling, when I first started dabbling in crypto, it was a lot of trading, um, and yes. also a lot of just spending time on Bitcoin talk forum <laughs> and trying to understand Damn. what this what this new OG. asset was, what this new technology is. Um, spending a lot of time just doing reading on my own again, trying to figure out what what was going on here. Um, when I moved out to the Bay Area, it was to take a job at a crypto startup called Chain, which was kind of a great transition for me from Wall Street in this much more traditional world, because at the time, Chain was working on building enterprise blockchains, if you will. So settlement solutions using blockchain technology, things like this for Wall Street. So we had partnerships with NASDAQ and Citibank and oh. a partnership as well with the IMF, the International Monetary Fund, to do an exploration for them. Um, all kinds of cool things. Uh, the The company ended up getting acquired by Stellar, the protocol, um, oh, wow. which yeah. to me was kind of an interesting early lesson, I guess, in my career. Like, there's public chains and then there's kind of the the private you know permissioned approaches to these things and i think in my view the public chains is where you tend to find the most differentiation in value and i think that that was a part of sort of the strategic uh acquisition or merger um with the seller protocol which was is you know more permissionless protocol than than the tech that we've been working on inside of chain. But um, that was an amazing experience with a lot of really amazing kind of crypto entrepreneurs who've gone on to do a lot of other things in the space. Um, but uh, yeah, from there, I started working with a lot of other crypto startups. This was sort of the heyday of 2017, where everyone was launching a new chain and doing an ICO yeah. and, and all of these sort of big experiments that were being run at the time. And just by, by virtue of having worked for a year, year and a half in the space, I had a lot of friends who were starting companies and starting up new projects um, around that period. And so, yeah, I spent a lot of time just doing sort of advisory work and a little bit of angel investing and stuff like that um, to get to work really across a whole range of projects, which... I loved and then eventually kind of led me into a, a stint in venture capital, which is a similar sort of bird's eye view of the whole space, which is an amazing opportunity. But... You know, it's it's incredible, like, like the type of perspective you get when you're involved, especially in crypto, um, from like a different from a different point of view. Like I remember yeah. 2017 is when I got introduced into crypto as well. And like. I, I I just remember like it felt like I had such like a good kind of idea of everything going on because like that was my first time using Twitter like I remember like uh, when, when like Bra uh, Brave for some reason Brave in particular I remember when they launched a token I remember Stellar was a huge deal back then as well like, yeah yeah all these little things were so exciting and it felt like every small thing was like another step to like this insane like kind of leap uh, of web two into web three it's like it's like the meme of like totally. oh my god we're onboarding the masses <laughs> totally totally i mean that was really how it felt at the time and it was just so fast and you know i would love to see i'm sure they're out there i would love to see you know the growth chart of like coinbase users over the course of the fall of 2017 Oh, yeah. um, because I'm sure that it was just parabolic, just going straight up kind of that hockey stick. Um, yeah, I, uh, I, I think that, uh, I think that, that was a really kind of cool, special time to be in the space. And as you say, to have this sort of bird's eye vantage point on so many different projects and their, 
experiments that they were running and all of them felt very real at the time and very impactful and I think that they were by and large all very impactful but some of them were more teaching us what not to do and some of them were yeah. teaching us again you know what the path forward might be right and it's like and, and just just how it's I, sometimes I feel like we don't appreciate how like how quick the space moves but, and it's like, because if you think about yeah. it, 2017, when I was kind of looking into the space, I wasn't thinking of, oh, like, what's on Ethereum? What's on this blockchain? Like, I was just looking at tokens as their own chains. Yeah. And, like, at that point, there were, like, the only DeFi that I think, I think it wasn't even 2017, I think it was 2018. The only DeFi I was familiar with was, um, I want to call it, it's like, it's like Fork Delta or Ether Delta or something like that. Oh, Ter- Ether Delta, yeah, of course. Right, and it's like they, and like, they were like the yeah. OG. They were the OG decks. <laughs> that was the that OG was all decks. there was for a while. Yeah, and then Zero X <laughs> came along and kind of introduced a new paradigm, and then obviously Uniswap and AMMs. But Ether Delta, that's a great throwback. Right, but it's like back then it was like it's just so interesting how we kind of look at things because you mentioned like like DeFi and these new primitives. DeFi was only really a thing at the beginning of the last bull market pretty much. Yeah. I mean, that's really yeah, what, totally. like, you know, I mean, then again, that was like three years ago. So, you know, maybe, maybe things move, they move <laughs> quick, but they also move kind of slow. <laughs> they move quickly, but it's like counting in dog years. It's like three years in crypto yeah, yeah. is a decade in, in normal time. I feel that, um, yeah, no, I I think that's right. And I think it's kind of interesting to think about what are the themes that we're all talking about now or taking for granted now that are going to look totally different and be totally transformed another three years from now. You know, again, I mean, you and I both work closely with the roll-up space kind of broadly, and that's obviously an area that's seeing a lot of growth right now and a lot of traction but then you kind of scrutinize it and you're like, oh, what is this going to look like three years from now? What are we going to look back on amongst the roll-ups that exist today and say, oh, wow, that was, you know, I can't believe that that was the paradigm at the time because it looks totally different today. Uh, kind of a, a fun thought experiment when, yeah, you've been in this space long enough and you know that the only thing you can count on is, is change and things continuing to evolve. That's a good point. I love that statement. The only thing you count on is change. I like that. <laughs> That's a good point. Um, so then did you do did you do anything in between like, you know, being in that kind of venture, the, 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 the kind of VC uh, uh, position and now uh, being at Espresso Systems? Or did you yeah, kind of make, uh, make that jump? There were a couple of uh, projects or initiatives that I was working on kind of in parallel to being an inventor or even prior. Um, One of which I mentioned to you earlier, I co-hosted a podcast with my friend Melton, who is also a great investor in the space, Melton Demirers, um, called What Grinds My Gears, that started out as just us (laughs) literally talking about what was grinding our gears about (laughs) what was going on in crypto at the time. Um, but ended up being a really fun undertaking for both of us for a period. And then the other big project that I worked on kind of around that time was a project called the Open Money Initiative, which is a research-oriented nonprofit that we worked on in conjunction with um, the Human Rights Foundation. It was me and two co-founders, Jamal Montessor, who... Uh, had a long career at IDEO as kind of a product designer and had spent time working on um, Bitcoin itself and things ranging from Bitcoin miners to privacy-oriented wallets for projects like Grin, if you remember that one. Um, Mm. And then also uh, co-founded with Alejandro Machado, who has done a lot of different product work himself in the space um, with companies like BitRefill and others. And he is he is from Venezuela and so kind of experienced some of what we ended up researching firsthand just in terms of how people in areas of financial repression um, or limited financial freedoms were and were also not using crypto. Um, so really our mission was to take what every, you know, talking head and venture capitalist, myself included, loves to get up on stage and say at a crypto conference, which is you know, okay, you're not using Bitcoin, but people in Venezuela or people in Lebanon, people in Iran, people in Nigeria are using Bitcoin as a lifeline. 
you know, because of the amount of financial repression going on there. Um, and uh, we took that as kind of a research prompt. And we did a series of projects to really understand where and how people were using Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies in these situations. And again, where they weren't. And, um, and then kind of explore some of the different product offerings that the industry might be able to work towards in order to meet those unmet needs. Um, so yeah, so that was the work with the Open Money Initiative, which was really rewarding, really cool. Honestly, kind of grew out for me of a sense of disillusionment, sort of post-2017 hype of like, right. all right, what are we actually doing here? We need to, as an industry, we need to get our affairs in order and, and actually figure out where the utility is. Um, and uh, yeah, came away with a lot of kind of great thoughts and conclusions from that about where where the limitations were. Um, one of which really was around scalability um, and kind of the expense of using Bitcoin. You know, it's become almost kind of a meme at this point that people tend to use Tether on Tron because it's it's just cheaper to move around. It's got lower transaction fees um, and still has a pretty solid liquidity profile. But that is kind of not the state of the world, I think, that I would like to ultimately see. Um, and so again, you know, a lot of that work that I did with the open money initiative has sort of fed into or inspired what I've gone on to work on since. That's great. That's it's so great to hear. Cause you know, I, I think that's one, like that, that, that to me at least is, uh, you know, don't get me wrong. When I got into crypto, like part of the, in, part of the, the interest was like, okay, I can make money off this stuff. Right. Um, yeah. but like, I feel like looking beyond that and especially when, when I think we're talking to like the public about this stuff, like it's it's really hard to educate people on like, yeah, like, yes, we, when you see crypto in the headlines, usually it's about some crazy guy scamming a ton of people out of money, unfortunately. But what you don't unfortunately, see yeah. is like the stuff happening in these third world countries um, that allow pretty much, it's literally like allows people to transact, um, buy things, sell things, et cetera. Like this is like, the, it's like the backbone of some of their economies because the local currency just isn't worth anything. Like that, that to me is yeah. like, that's why we do this, right? Um, Exactly. Yeah, and I mean, what we found, to be clear, was that the use of crypto is not as widespread as we, we'd all like to imagine it is in these right. places. You know, it's not like it's ubiquitous. But where it is being used, it's actually extremely meaningful, whether it's, you know, people being able to receive remittances where they wouldn't otherwise be able to just by using a platform at the time, like local Bitcoins was the most popular one um, right. that we came across or whether it was, you know, a young student who got into Bitcoin mining and was using the Bitcoin being generated as a lifeline for her family, like these really impactful stories. And the question that people always ask me, having done this research, is like, oh, well, what percent of the population would you say is using, is using crypto in a place like Venezuela? And it's like, the answer to that is not going to be what you want to hear. <laughs> I don't have the answer to that, certainly not today, but it's probably like low single digits, you know, have 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 used it on some kind of regular basis um, for real purpose uh, in terms of percentage. But where it is being used, it is very impactful and it is it can change lives. And I think that that's, again, kind of the thing that I cling to. And again, the thing that kind of drives me to work on making these systems even better and more usable so that we can actually get to that end state where things have improved. No, totally. And, 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 and I guess like, to, I, I, I feel like to the, like, I guess I kind of said it earlier, but you know, I think, I think the, the like, as you mentioned, the end state, the, the end state is like, you know, when pe where people are using these systems um, and, and it, to me, it doesn't have to be the most like, frictionless thing out there but it does need to be like to the point where like take tron right people are using tron like you said because it's just cheap it just works um yeah but the problem with for that now. is that it's like for now <laughs> that's the problem it's for now and it's like yeah. to a lot of people yeah. that's crypto to me it's like like the, the nirvana state is when you create a system that's sufficiently decentralized or at least credibly kind of building towards that decentralization to you know uh you know for that day 
um, and it may not be here for us in the U.S. today, but it may be here next year, two years, 10 years, 100 years down the line, where it's already set up, it's already working, it's scaling. Um, and, you know, money talks at the end of the day. And it's like if most of the most of humanity is moving their money on blockchains and not through these centralized entities or providers, like we have, we have the power as, as people, right? Not the governments, yeah. not the, uh, you know. So, you know, yeah, it's it's a it's a it's a such a loaded topic, but I totally agree. It's a, we're not we're, we're not where we want to be today, but I think the hope is that we build slowly and progressively and safely, of course, towards that nirvana state, like you were saying, for sure. And to your point, it does it does come back to governance at the end of the day, right? And oh, yeah. and um, part of that is the actual kind of decentralization and therefore censorship resistance of the systems that we're building. And then part of that is the very social kind of human level governance, right? Of, um, you know, what, what would the world look like if instead of using the SWIFT network for international payments, which can be shut down, which does exclude sanctioned countries that the U.S. decides it doesn't want to trade with and things like this, you know, what would the world look like if all global payments were running on Arbitrum, right? And then it was Arbitrum governance, you know, making making big decisions about sort of the path forward of the technology and what to support and not. I think it's, it's a very radical vision of the future. Again, when you especially think about just how complex governance can get, especially on that size and scale, but um, it's, it's an exciting vision of the future, much more exciting to me than anything being worked on in kind of the traditional financial system. I thought we were just all in this for airdrops, no? <laughs> <laughs> that was that was a few years ago. That was 2021 era crypto. <laughs> okay, there you go. <laughs> um, okay, so then you pretty much, like you're saying, kind of moved on from the open money initiative. Um, but it, it seems like you now being here at Espresso Systems, CSO, like that that's kind of, it's you're not like focusing directly on what you're talking, we were just talking about, but you're almost no. enabling it through what you guys are building in a way. Yeah, that's, that's the goal. I mean, I, yeah. So espresso systems, just for context, we are working yeah. on infrastructure for rollups. Um, I think probably most people listening here know what a rollup is, uh, given, <laughs> given the creators of this podcast, but um, rollups being, you know, these uh, layers of technology that move a lot of the computation, et cetera, uh, off of a platform like Ethereum in order to basically free up capacity on Ethereum and help to scale uh, the overall network. So I, I think, you know, I could name many instances where I felt the pain point of Ethereum specifically not being sufficiently scaled, whether this was trying to participate in early ICOs that were happening. You know, I remember trying to participate in like the zero X uh, token distribution that happened way back in 2017, speaking of early DeFi. And I remember the system just being so clogged that I could not, I could not get my transaction through no matter how high I set the fee on it. And I was trying to pay these like astronomical fees just to get in. Um, or again, I mean, more kind of of a real world use case, talking to folks in these places like Venezuela and hearing from them that, you know, Bitcoin or whatever it was, was actually prohibitively expensive to send at times um, and the problems that that created for them, uh, you know, really drove home the importance of having scaling solutions like layer two roll ups. Um, now, where Espresso comes into this picture, we are not developing a roll-up, to be clear. We're not working on kind of that part of the stack. What we're working on instead is a part of the stack called the sequencer, which is a critical component of roll-ups. It's what puts transactions in the order that they go in in order to be executed. Um, and uh, currently today, most roll-up sequencers are not decentralized which causes some of its own problems. And most rollups are also existing kind of in their own silos, right? So part of the beauty of something like Ethereum, people call it the infinite garden as opposed to being inside of a walled garden. Everything happening on Ethereum is 
like composable with each other. You can do a swap on Uniswap and have it automatically interact with another contract and things like this. You lose some of that capability when you enter this you know, highly scaled, but roll up centric future where each roll up then becomes its own sort of garden within the infinite garden of Ethereum. And we're seeking to help uh, ameliorate some of those issues around interoperability with the espresso sequencer as well. So that's a little bit of what we're looking to, to fix and solve. I think um, for me, a lot of the driving force hunter comes back to something that you said earlier, which is that People, people use these systems today and assume that they are fully mature and just totally sound and will work kind of no matter what they are. Most end users of crypto are not sitting down and reading the really fine print about what's centralized, what's decentralized, what's ruled by some kind of, you know, democratic token oriented governance process, what is governed by just like a centralized entity, um, all of these types of things. And I think if you look under the hood of what the state of a lot of rollups are on Ethereum today, there are a lot of limitations that still exist um, and uh, a lot of fine print that people maybe should be reading for a lot of the rollups. Um, and we're looking to come in and help to accelerate solutions uh, to those issues that are outstanding. Totally. Yeah, no, and it's it's so funny because I think the, uh, it's it's kind of like, um, it's a problem on, I think, on a couple ends. Um, I, so I, I think, like, having, so just, you know, I guess one argument could be, why don't, why don't just remove the sequencer? Who needs a sequencer, right? Um, I think to a certain extent, if we're just talking, you know, brass tacks, just kind of straightforward, roll-ups, so roll-ups with sequencers, I mean, well, every rollup is a sequencer now, but um, sequencers just make things like buttery smooth and just instantaneous, right? Like, and, and it's, I think it's something that's needed for that end state that, that, that we that we keep on mentioning. Like, you like you, you need things for the most part that'll like as soon, as soon as you send it in, like you know, like as soon as as soon as you press X, Y happens, kind of thing, right? Um, instead yeah. of like having to submit a transaction, wait for it to go through. Hopefully, you, you know, you, you have enough gas, whatever the hell that is, <laughs> for it to go through. Like in the real <laughs> world, this isn't a thing, you know. <laughs> so like, well, I, I, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, the sequencer plays a, a few different roles in this. One is that most people today using rollups, certainly when I go to right. do a transaction on a rollup, I take the confirmation, if you will, that the sequencer gives me as some kind of guarantee in my mind that like, all right, my transaction has happened. It's gone through. I can right. trust this as, as being final, right? People will call these pre-confirmations, which I think is a little bit more accurate to reflect that perhaps the transaction is not fully reflected on Ethereum and therefore shouldn't be considered totally final yet. Um, and there's all kinds of other kind of caveats that can go along with this. But in reality, people are taking the sequencer's word that, okay, the transaction's been included, therefore I'm going to kind of think of it as, as done. Um, this is this is a great thing in many ways from a user experience perspective because as you say it makes everything feel buttery smooth like it's all happening instantly which has been a huge problem historically in terms of ux within crypto where it feels like everything is painfully slow and you're waiting for six you know six block finality on bitcoin or whatever it is but it also comes with the caveat that oh you're by the way, you're trusting to some degree, and again, depends a little bit on the roll-up system, but you're trusting the sequencer now. And if that sequencer is just a server being run by a centralized entity, then it's sort of like, well, okay, we're back to TradFi, basically. Um, and so that's a big part of what Espresso is working on, is working to improve on those trust assumptions that users have to make in order to trust the sequencer. Um, without compromising on the time that it takes for users to get an answer back from it without compromising on, again, I'm going to keep using this. I love it. That buttery smooth sort of experience um, that, that people know and expect. And then there's another part of the sequencer, which is um, it has a very direct sort of uh, 
correlation to issues that arise in traditional finance, which is that, again, it's responsible for putting transactions in an order. Um, and you might kind of at face value look at that and say, well, what do you mean? It should just be the order in which the transactions come in. Right. But achieving first come first serve basis for transactions is actually very difficult because then you end up with people playing all kinds of latency games. Again, this takes place in traditional finance as well, where hedge funds and so forth will try to put their servers as close to the the server of the exchange as possible physically in order to have there be less time that their transactions have to travel in order to reach the server that is is executing them. Um, and if you want to have a really fair system, then you've got to mitigate for stuff like this. And that's where I think the team at Offchain Labs and, and around the Arbitrum ecosystem has done a lot of great work um, developing a proposal called Time Boost to help mitigate some of these latency games. And um, that's something I'm really excited about with Espresso is that we've got this research collaboration with Offchain Labs uh, and also a development collaboration wherein Espresso is working on creating and building and implementing uh, a time boost system that can be plugged into our sequencer as an option for rollups that want that kind of first come first serve uh, and uh, hopefully quite fair experience for their users. Um, but yeah, the sequencer is kind of a fascinating component. There's a lot to unpack with it. It's, I think, frequently overlooked or thought of as something that can come sort of secondary to the rest of the rollup stack. But um, it's, mm -hmm. it's actually very critical. And if you spend enough time on Twitter looking at least at my Twitter feed, you'll see that people are actually very passionate about the sort of design choices that go into systems like this. Totally. No, yeah. And, and I think maybe to touch on a little bit to what you said earlier is, you know, like, to what extent can shared sequencing help with yeah this idea that, that people, we uh, think is probably a lot more talked about now in the industry of, of like cross-chain communication, like executing transaction on one chain and having it kind of uh, interact with something on another chain. Um, like, does it kind of help fill that gap? Is it just a piece of that, you know, piece, piece of that pie? It's like... Yeah, it's a piece of the puzzle for sure. Um, so if you think about, uh, there, there's many ways to sort of approach the problem of cross rollup interoperability. Um, one of which is to have uh, components called cross rollup builders that are uh, building and composing blocks and sort of playing this role, right, of, of actually trying to intelligently order transactions in such a way that um, that either users maximally benefit or in some cases they, the builders, as kind of selfish parties, maximally benefit, but hopefully competition drives down the margin that they can take over time. Um, but these builders can play a role of being able to look at sort of the full flow of transactions coming into them. Um, and then being able to respect the wishes or sort of intents is kind of the buzzword that people are using now of the user in terms of what they're trying to do across multiple rollups. Now, if you think about a world where every rollup is running its own separate sequencer, then these builder components need to coordinate with n different sequencers across n different rollups in order to get the intents of the user uh, met. Now, if they're just having to coordinate with one sequencer, which is then working for many different rollups, then that is not only much kind of operationally simpler for the builder, but it also allows the builder to make a guarantee to users in a way that it wouldn't be able to otherwise in terms of, okay, hey, if I get this block through, then your, your intent across all of these different rollups will be fulfilled. Um, again, whereas if it was having to coordinate across two or three or four or n different sequencers, it wouldn't be able to make that kind of commitment to users. So that's an example of where having a shared sequencer can be really helpful across different rollups um, in terms of solving for things like cross-chain, cross-rollup 
uh, transactions and atomicity and so forth. You know, and, and I think, you know, we, uh, especially recently, you know, of course, with uh, after this collab that we had, um, I feel like we've, uh, you know, we we're kind of assuming, especially with the kind of the, um, the introduction of like more rollups kind of being introduced based off of different team stacks, um, Arbitrum stack, I guess, being an example, uh, that like, you know, people will, and, and I guess this will only really affect L2s or, you know, I should say like rollups in general. Um, but as we speak, there are still people launching like L1s um, and I guess whatever kind of fancy terms you want to call it. Like, do you think there is a world where you have like an L1 running a sequencer? Is that a thing? So, I mean, interestingly, we're seeing more and more L1s transition to being L2s themselves or being right, yeah. components of L2 infrastructure where... Polygon, in many ways, for a long time, has been an L1. It's been a side chain, but uh, sort of its own proof of stake system, so sort of an L1. They obviously are making this great big push into the roll up space with their ZK EVM and their CDK environment. Um, Celo is another great example of an L1 that is working on a transition to becoming an L2. Uh, Mirror Protocol just announced last week that they're working on a proving system for um, ZK EVMs, and they're also working on kind of a fact finality system that L2s will be able to use. So I don't see a whole lot of new L1s continuing to come to market. In fact, what I'm seeing is a lot of L1s pivoting to become components of the L2 stack. And in a way, this goes for Espresso as well, where we started out a few years ago, we were actually working on an L1 in a very different direction. Right. And it was about a year ago, a little over a year ago, that we took a hard look at what we built on the consensus side and said to ourselves, actually, this would be much more better used within the L2 ecosystem and what we built, you know, as a consensus protocol and as kind of a, a networking system uh, would be much more better, would be much, much better applied in uh, in a sequencer as opposed to its own L1 system. Um, so I like to think of ourselves as one of the first L1s to kind of pivot to the L2 stack. Uh, and definitely for us, that's felt like absolutely the right move and kind of never looking back. That's hilarious. That's good fun fact, by the way. Um, yeah, exactly. <laughs> a little bit of the inside baseball of where we come from, where we're going to. <laughs> oh yeah, and and, and I, I guess it. You know, to me, it's like I feel like in hindsight, it'll always make more sense because it's like, especially you know, with all these new L ones launching, I think one of the, like one of the things that I, I still have not seen any of them address, which to me is like one of the biggest reasons why we have L twos in the first place, and and you know just. I guess one of, one of the biggest reasons that I think isn't talked about enough is like state growth, right? Like, like no other yeah. L1 faces that issue right now and they're not worrying about it very likely. Right. But it's like, they'll inevitably get to the point where like, you know, the, the, their block space on, you know, on, on the base chain is too much. We need to start scaling. How do we do it? You do it with L2s. <laughs> it's, 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 exactly. to me it's inevitable. Yeah. I, I have this sort of prior of always trying to look for, the project that's living in all of the other projects future so like uh -huh. ethereum as sort of you know the first of its kind of this smart contract system model etc it's living in the future of every other l1 right uh, hopefully yeah. for those l1s where like right. if those l1s achieve sufficient user base and transaction volume and all of this they're going to face the same problems uh, in many ways that Ethereum did, unless they've taken a completely different approach in terms of their architecture, which some of them have. But I think also if you look at the roll-up space, I mean, I always say this about Arbitrum and the Arbitrum community, that because Arbitrum has been around the longest and has a very mature stack and all of this, you're kind of living in the future, I think, in this right. community of what a lot of other rollups might face in terms of pain points or considerations or also great outcomes, um, hopefully for those rollups uh, down the line. 
And I think that that's, I think that that's exactly right in terms of Ethereum on state growth and, um, and probably again, many other angles of it as well. Totally. And, and, and I will say, I think like, uh, I think what's so cool, especially like, like you were saying, kind of like on the, on the, uh, on Arbitrum, like we'll, we'll take Arbitrum one as, as an example. It's just like the new, like, it's like the, the new types of, like the different types of things that you can start to finally build because you're on an environment that's much faster, much cheaper. Um, and then you, even beyond being able to do that today, like, you know, tons of applications on Arbitrum one today that would never, never be able to exist on Ethereum just because it's too expensive. Um, you know, is like this introduction of like what we're developing here at off-chain, at off-chain uh, stylus, right? So like the ability to essentially yeah. create like Rust-based smart contracts, for example, on the same chain that you have Solidity-based smart contracts living on. And like in a nutshell, just allows for a ton, a ton more like, you know, uh, like new potential applications to exist, like ZK related ones, maybe uh, things related to machine learning, just things that are very, very computationally expensive that, yeah. you know, that were never possible on L1, possibly were network kind of, you know, on the, uh, also probably not possible on L2, but finally able to happen on L2 through like this kind of running these, these two virtual machines, I guess, in tandem. You're right. I think I feel like we're living in the future. It's pretty insane every time I think about it's, it. <laughs> it's very cool. It's very cool. And I think, um, yeah, I mean, I think that, again, this is an example of where, you know, the Arbitrum community has probably felt acutely the pain point of onboarding net new devs to not just to Arbitrum, not just to Ethereum, but actually into crypto in general. I remember doing a whole bunch of sort of user research amongst developers. This was a few years ago, sort of more at the peak of the last bull market and talking to specifically developers who are coming from different areas outside of crypto. And many of them who I spoke to were building on Solana and other systems because they could not be bothered to learn Solidity or they felt like Solidity was too limited relative to their needs. Um, and so, yeah, certainly when I saw the news about Stylus, I was like, all right, they, they get it. This is, this is going to be a cool new avenue to onboard, again, net new devs into crypto overall, which is really exciting. Oh yeah, and, and I think I forgot if it was Steven who said it on our side or someone else, but it's like it was like it's like the idea of like instead of making the developers come where we're at, just make, meeting them where they're at, you know? Yeah, like, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Especially in it's this like, market, you're not gonna you're not gonna make them come to you <laughs> in large part. So you got to go out and find them. For sure. That's a good point. Yeah, like th thinking ahead. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Are there any uh, other things, I guess, you know, whether it be like, uh, I guess like, you know, on the L2 front that excites you about like what you see kind of happening in the current market? Yeah, I think, um, I mean, one thing I think is really exciting to me is just this proliferation of L2s and not just sort of general purpose L2s like Arbitrum 1 or Optimism or ZK Sync, but really kind of special purpose L2s of applications launching L2s or kind of NFT specific L2s or DeFi specific L2s that each sort of use case or application may end up with its own environment, um, I think is really exciting because I think that then there's suddenly a lot of room to experiment within that in terms of everything ranging from governance and uh, incentives and you know how you onboard developers and what the user experience looks like there's just a lot of room to kind of customize which i guess is a whole part of this modular stack thesis that has been popular popularized by celestia and others and that i think espresso very much plays into um i think the big question there is just how do we solve for interoperability and and the ability of these roll-ups to really smoothly uh uh, interoperate with each other. Um, but again, my, my hope and, and, um, my, I guess, uh, prediction is that Espresso will play a big role in that. And, um, one thing I'm really excited about looking ahead into kind of next year and our roadmap is 
integrations with all kinds of different bridge protocols and and um, cross chain communication protocols and things like that that will be able to contribute to solving those problems. But I just, if you'd asked me a year ago how many rollups will there be, I would probably have kind of shrugged and been like, maybe ten. But if you asked me today, I would yeah. say, oh. I mean, hundreds, maybe short term, even thousands, and then I think we'll see some consolidation. But I think it's a really exciting kind of new realm to experiment in. Totally, and, and you know, I think what you said there—it's like, like experimentation. I think is the name of the game. Obviously, security first and foremost, for sure. But like, I think that, sure. <laughs> like, like experimentation is literally part of the reason why L two is so valuable. Is that you can start, like you know, you mentioned stylus. Like you can start experimenting with these like kind of novel ideas and then who knows down the line in the future if, it, if it's worked out very well for a particular L2, it's something that yeah. maybe the Ethereum ecosystem considers adding onto the base layer, right? It's yeah, like, it's, absolutely. Yeah, it's so invaluable, I think, for sure. I, I think to, uh, to, to move on to, uh, you know, we're kind, of, we're kind of coming to the end here. I got, I got a couple of general, silly general questions, some related to crypto, some not, um, but I'd love your take on it. Um, like what kind of role do you see, uh, crypto playing in the global financial system? And when I, when I say that, I, what I, what I really mean is like, do you think it's going to be the kind of thing where it's like people are using dApps every day, like everyday people, is it going to be the kind of thing where it's kind of like the rails powering these other big, you know, applications or like web two kind of things. So like people don't really feel it kind of like how like the internet works, for example. Um, like where, where do you, where do you think crypto kind of comes into the big picture? Do you think? the future i think i think medium term sort of say next 10 years i think okay. that crypto will become an option amongst many in terms of the rails and sort of the infrastructure underpinning financial movements and transactions so i can very much see a future pretty near term where a non-trivial amount of global remittances, for example, are happening in USDC on blockchains, perhaps to some degree, you know, uh, some non-trivial portion of the population using them, maybe are still accessing them through custodial applications, but certainly not all, maybe not even the majority. Um, and I think that that's a really exciting vision for the future just in and of itself and having this be an alternative again, to using Western Union or TransferWise just to use the remittances use case. I think that the same could be said for everything ranging from, to go back to kind of my origins in the space, like security settlement to, uh, you know, B2B transactions worldwide. Um, again, just an alternative. I don't necessarily see it subsuming or taking out the existing systems on that time frame. And I certainly don't see sort of Bitcoin or Ethereum or any of these things being adopted as like the global reserve currency. I think that we're still a very long way from that. And that would take a big kind of breakdown in society for us to, us to move on to that as sort of the global reserve asset. I Frankly, I hope that doesn't happen because that means that something societally has gone very, very wrong. Um, totally. But I think long term, I could see crypto rails becoming the default rails for certain types of transactions as well. Again, perhaps not all. I don't think every transaction needs to take place in a fully decentralized, quote unquote, trustless environment. Um, but again, I think certainly for some types, perhaps many types, um, we'll see a movement into these types of systems that can just make a different set of guarantees for users, whether those users are individuals living in Venezuela trying to escape hyperinflation, or whether they are for big corporations trying to move money cross-border um, or anywhere in between. That would be still the long-term vision, which hasn't changed that much since I first got into the space a decade ago. <laughs> no, totally. Yeah. And, 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 I, and I feel like this, this next one kind of plays into that a little bit. But like, do you think that, what well, I should say is like, how do you think we change that perception of crypto being a bad thing to the public? Like, you know, criminals use it, kills the environment, et cetera. Like, is it, is it a rebrand? Is it like, is it maybe showing that it does help people in different countries? Like, 
I think the biggest thing is just being real about it. I uh, So I wrote this op-ed a few years ago that I got absolutely lambasted for <laughs> through uh, from all of these people in the crypto community, many of whom like I really love and respect. And I logged on one morning and saw that this Coindesk op-ed had gone live and gotten posted and I was just getting ripped apart. And the title of it was something like, um, you know, cr- it, crypto is mainly good for uh, sort of, I'm going to look it up because I'm going to get it wrong. It didn't say illicit transactions, but oh boy. Um, <laughs> uh, that'll do it. <laughs> it. That's how a lot of people read it. And that was the problem. Oh, Sorry. okay. Here we go. Sorry. <laughs> so the title of this was cryptocurrency is useful for breaking laws and social constructs. <laughs> Which, <laughs> I'll do it. <laughs> I did not write. I I did not author the title. To be clear, I I left it up to the editors, the good people at CoinDesk, to come up with the title, oh, yeah. which was a lesson learned. I then had them yeah. run the title past me. But the takeaway from this op-ed, which I still stand by, is that cryptocurrency is great for breaking social constructs. You know, and we can we can talk about what exactly that means, you know, whether that means literally illicit finance, which I actually think it's quite terrible for. And if you look at the numbers, it's not being right. used in a very widespread way. You know, uh, Chainalysis and, and companies like this do these big studies on this every year. And it's like on the order of basis points in terms of percentage of transactions in crypto that actually are associated with anything um, sort of illicit finance oriented, but, you know, cryptocurrency, if it's decentralized and uh, therefore seeking to be credibly neutral and censorship resistant, then it, it is great for, you know, use in avoiding capital controls in a place like Argentina or Venezuela. Um, it is great for supporting dissidents in Hong Kong or Nigeria. Um, and, And I think that it's important for us as an industry to be real and honest about where there are benefits to it, um, while also then backing up the fact that criminals are not using it at scale with the numbers that the good folks, again, over at Chainalysis and TRM and elsewhere can can support with. Um, But I think that where the industry shoots itself in the foot a bit is by just trying to fully avoid these topics or by really digging the heels in and saying, no, it's not being used at all for any of these types of things that you're worried about. I think people broadly appreciate it when you do introduce nuance. Same thing with the environment question, right? Like, yeah, proof of work is problematic from an energy consumption perspective, but most of the industries moved away from proof of work. Also, you know, if you look at sort of the tech landscape broadly, no one is really talking about how many, you know, how, what the environmental footprint of training these large language models in AI is like, you know, you can make all kinds of comparisons. Um, And then also you can recognize that even for proof of work, which again, most of the industry has moved away from uh, the incentives are such that those who are engaging in proof of work are incentivized to find the cheapest electricity available to them. And often that's going to be some renewable source. Um, And again, there are lots of great resources that show, you know, the migration into renewables by Bitcoin mining over time. So I I think really for me, it comes down to acknowledging some of the problems and the nuances around them. Um, And I think that's how you get people to engage and then ultimately change the narratives. But it's definitely, it continues to be difficult. It continues to be an uphill battle. Certainly when I got back into the space back in 2013, most of my friends thought that I'd lost my mind. And, you know, Bitcoin was sort of had this uh, reputation of just being something that drug dealers and terrorists used. Um, And and that, of course, as we've seen over time, is not at all the case. Um, But we do need to keep keep backing up those arguments and uh, while also acknowledging the areas in which crypto does fall short and keep working towards solutions to- for them. Totally. No, a hundred percent. And I, I agree, by the way, I, I think 
like definitely, you know, de- deflecting to me is like something anyone can do. And, and to me, it's like, if for some reason it's, it feels like a default, um, just generally, I think like, you know, as human beings, I feel like deflecting is kind of like, you know, the natural reaction, but nuance to me is, is the key. And it, it sucks that you can't really add nuance to a title. So, you know, I apologize, uh, you know, for that for that article that CoinDesk <laughs> really really took the <laughs> took the reins on. <laughs> but, but yeah, it's okay. Crazy. They've got they they've got their incentives. They wanted to generate clicks, and that they did. They did it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and it worked out for oh, me yeah. too because I was quite happy for my message to make it far and wide. So it's not a criticism of them. They know what they're doing. Um, oh my happy God. to be in their hands, but. Okay, um, I have okay. I have one last question, and this this might actually probably be a relatively long one, but uh, I th- I thought it was relevant. Um, I think one, I think one thing that we don't talk about as much. I feel like you know when I'm watching podcasts, when I'm talking to people, just generally, um, crypto and out of crypto, is like the revelation that's happened over the past couple of years of the democratization of of investing. Uh, in finance, I guess generally, and to me, it's like you know I'll I'll, I'll personally attribute Robinhood largely to that. Um, yeah. They've done some things in the past that maybe we all don't don't agree with. But <laughs> one thing that I can agree with is they made it really easy for the average Joe to launch an app and just start investing right away. Um, DeFi to me is the next iteration of that. But I just love your thoughts on that. You know, like as being someone who was in TradFi way before Robinhood uh, and now in crypto, um, you know, pretty much both, uh, both opposite ends of the spectrum. Um, but just curious in your thoughts on that. I think it's really important. It's definitely something I'm very passionate about. Um, I think that I was fortunate, again, to grow up sort of around finance and investing and trading that gave me a comfort with it. Um, mm-hmm. But I I look around at peers or family members or whoever who do not have that comfort with it and feel just discouraged to even try to learn about the markets and try to make their own investment decisions. And that I think is criminal in a country and in society where, you know, lottery tickets are uh, in many ways state funded and, and, you know, go towards, go towards tax um, and therefore kind of almost condoned right by the government. It's like, People should not feel more empowered to go out and buy a literal lottery ticket from their gas station than they do to read a few news articles about Microsoft and make an equity investment in it. That is, there is something backwards in our society when that is the case. Um, And I think Robinhood has done a lot to bring people on board. Um, I think, as you say, they've made some questionable decisions and represented things in some questionable ways. Again, this is why we need sort of transparent systems in finance. And I think DeFi has also gone a long way um, in terms of doing that. Now I think we just need to continue to invest in education, though, because there's nothing that sort of breaks my spirit as I look at crypto uh, more than seeing consumers just aping into tokens and then getting pumped and then dumped on and and just that sort of roller coaster ride which i think is still all too frequent um i'm not particularly excited about crypto as a speculative space or a speculative asset but i do think to the extent that it can offer solutions to again some of the transparency problems that we see in um investing in general and then to some of the like onboarding and user comfort issues that we see in investing in general that I am very excited about. Awesome. No, totally. Yeah. I, and I, I think it's like, I don't know. And, and I feel like you really do really do appreciate it. Um, when you look at the options beforehand and again, we we'll use Robinhood as the example. I remember at a time when my, when my dad was showing me, uh, like he was teaching me about investing and I remember him showing me, I think, the, the website for TD Ameritrade. Uh, and I just, it's hieroglyphics. I mean, I was a kid. But like also, yeah. I just like, yeah, like totally. what, what is any of this? <laughs> totally. <laughs> Scary, right? Uh, and these guys turned it into like a game. <laughs> for better or for worse. <laughs> and the totally. DeFi is just, like you said, just the far other uh, other end of the spectrum, which has its, has its pros and cons, I think. But um, ultimately, yeah. 
um, puts power in the back back of the hands of the people, which I think is important. yeah. Just education is crucial, though, and you know, yeah. making sure that people understand the risks of what they're getting into and all of that as well, of course. But... Awesome. Well, Jill, uh, it's been a pleasure having you on. I um, appreciate your insight that you kind of uh, bestowed upon us here today on the podcast. Um, and yeah, we look forward to collabing with you uh, in the future. Thank you so much, Hunter. Yeah, very glad to be working with you. Thanks for having Likewise. me on. Thank you for watching this week's episode of Beneath the Layers. If you're interested in listening to more, make sure to check us out on YouTube or on any of the other major podcasting platforms. Also, we're hiring. So if you're interested in uh, working on cutting edge tech, scaling Ethereum, etc., make sure to apply at jobs.lever.co forward slash off chain labs. Additionally, a disclaimer, nothing in this podcast should be taken or understood as financial advice of any kind uh, and all opinions expressed by the host, myself, or the guests are solely their opinions, my opinions, and do not reflect the opinions of Offchain Labs as a company. All that being said, thank you for watching. See you guys in the next one.